Our first speaker today is Riley Gaines. And <laughs> she's an NCAA 12 time All American swimmer who is making more than just waves in our country. Like Riley, I am also a collegiate swimmer, so I fully understand how both mentally and physically challenging our sport is. Competition is never ending, and even after a season's worth of training, many are grateful to drop mere portions of a second. When we now must compete not only with hundreds of inspiring female athletes who dedicate so much to their sport, but with biological males, chances of placing start to fade. This injustice to women should no longer be tolerated. Here to ensure that we keep women's sports for women only, please welcome Riley Gaines. Thank you guys so much. Um, First of all, I just want to say how refreshing it is to be in front of an audience that doesn't want to, like, throw me off a bridge. Um, <laughs> and I say that, you know, being funny, but seriously. Um, just a few months ago, I went to San Francisco State University where I was met with ambush. Um, I was assaulted. I was held for ransom for over three and a half hours where these protesters demanded that if I wanted to make it home to see my family safely again, I had to pay them money. Law enforcement, who was there, did nothing. The school, the next day, they sent out an email to their student body, doubling down, saying they were so proud of their brave students for handling me in the manner that they did. Um, so I don't take an applause for granted. <laughs> so thank you, guys. But a little bit about me. I just recently graduated from the University of Kentucky where I finished my career proudly as a 12-time NCAA All-American, um, a five-time SEC champion. I'm actually the SEC record holder in the 200 butterfly, which means I have really big shoulders under this. Um, Two-time Olympic trial qualifier, SEC Scholar Athlete of the Year, SEC Community Service Leader of the Year. But all of that to say, it's impossible to put into words the amount of time and sacrifices and dedication that it takes to compete at that level. It's a lifelong journey. Um, I also graduated with my degree in human health sciences and health law and had every intent upon graduation to go to dental school. That's what I had planned for myself. Actually, what I wanted to do was endodontics, which is root canals, weirdly enough. Um, but I realized the quickest way to make God laugh in your face is to make plans for yourself. And he very blatantly had different plans for me. And this all, of course, came to arise after that national championships my senior year. But I'll take you back a little, a little bit. I started swimming when I was four, um, started swimming year round when I was eight. So this means that in second grade, you're swimming two hours every single day. And it really only gets worse from there because by the time you're in middle school, high school, you're practicing before school. You go to school, you go back to practice, you come home from practice, you ice your shoulders, you eat your dinner, you do your homework, you go to bed, and you wake up, and you do it all again the next day. Um, you don't get to go to prom, or vacation with your family, or sleepovers with your friends, or any of that. But I, I knew that, and I was willing to do that because I knew my goals. Ultimately, I ended up choosing the University of Kentucky. I'm biased. I think the SEC is by far the best conference. Sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> my dad, he was an SEC, SEC football player. My mom, she played softball. All my family played in the SEC, and so I knew that's what I wanted to do. But I always thought I was going to be a Florida Gator. And so I took my trip to Florida, and it just, I didn't get that feeling of home that I'm told you get when you, when you finally find your place. And so I, I kind of started making my rounds. Um, my boyfriend at the time, which is not the man I'm married to now, he was a big Kentucky fan. And so this coach, he kept pestering me and pestering me, you know, come on a trip here. Um, we'll take you to a basketball game. It'll be super fun. And Kentucky wasn't a good swimming school. And so I had no interest. But I figured, you know, to be totally frank, I'll just take advantage of them and I'll go to the basketball game and I'll, you know, I'll be able to take my boyfriend. It'll be like a cool Christmas gift. Um, but I went there, 
and I fell in love with the university. I fell in love with the coach. That coach who was pestering me is now my best friend. Um, the team, the city, the resources they poured into, not just your athletics, but also your academics and your service, and I, I loved it. And so on a whim, I committed. Didn't even tell my parents. Um, but I couldn't be more grateful for that. And so freshman year starts, and I, it was a lot of adjusting. We swam six hours every single day, which is, we swam about 10 miles every day. Three of those hours being before 8 a.m. So we'd swim from 5 a.m. to 8 a.m., come back, or go to class, and then come back and swim from 1.30 to 4.30. Um, so I was essentially wrecked my entire freshman year. I think I was just sore for 365 days straight. Um, but then sophomore year starts. And I finally developed a sense of consistency. And I was having this breakout season. Um, March of 2020, I was ready to continue this breakout season into our national championships, which is the meet you work all year for. It's the fastest meet in the world. Uh, March of 2020, about three days before we were supposed to leave for our national championships, um, our coaches pulled us out of the water and they said, you have to pack your things up and leave campus tonight. Um, COVID had shut everything down. And so we never got a break in swimming, yet we were being sent home in the middle of March. We were there all summer. We were there over Christmas, over Thanksgiving. We never got to go home. Um, and so secretly, I was pretty excited. I was like, oh my gosh, yes. But that excitement lasted all of 24 hours before I realized what this really meant. Um, there were no pools open. There were no gyms open. And so being from lovely Tennessee, where there's an abundance of lakes, I put on a wetsuit every day and swam miles aimlessly in this lake, just hoping and praying that I would continue that breakout season when we would eventually come back to college. Um, and I, I did just that. Um, my junior year started, and I was able to continue this breakout season. And so ultimately, my junior year, this is when I was able to win my first SEC title. We won our first SEC title as a team in school history, which was exciting. And I ultimately finished seventh in the country which I was proud of. Um, to be top eight, I was an All-American, um, but I knew I was capable of more. And so it was right then and there when I placed seventh that I made it my goal my senior year to win a national title, which would of course mean becoming the fastest female swimmer in the country in my event. And so senior year starts up and I'm right on pace to do just that. About middle of my senior season, I was ranked third in the country. A few one hundredths of a second behind the girl who was ranked in second, um, to which I knew her very well. Because like in most sports, your top tier athletes, you know of each other, regardless of where you compete in the country because you've grown up competing against each other. So I knew her very well. But the person who was ranked first by body links, I'd never heard of before. And this is the first time I became aware of a swimmer named Leah Thomas. And so there was a lot of red flags. This was a senior, um, from University of Pennsylvania, which is not historically a school that produces fast swimmers. Um, they were ranked at the top, the swimmer, uh, the top of the country in the 100 freestyle, which is a sprint, and all of the freestyle events in between until the mile. And so if you think about this, for those of you who don't understand swimming, if you think about this in terms of your Olympic runners, your best 200 meter runner is not your best marathon runner. But that's what we were seeing in this person. So a lot of it didn't make sense. I was talking to my coaches, my family, my teammates. Who is this person? And we had no idea. Until an article came out a few days after these nation leading times were posted. And in this article, very briefly, in a blip of a sentence, it says, Leah Thomas is formerly Will Thomas and swam three years on the men's team at University of Pennsylvania before deciding to switch to the women's team. And then the article carried on as if we weren't supposed to just read that. And I was so shocked. Of course I was shocked, but really I felt a sense of relief when I read this. And I say this because I then looked up who Will Thomas was because I was curious. Was this a lateral movement? Was this someone who went from ranking first to now continuing to rank first among the women? Which is of course not what we saw. We saw that this was a mediocre male, at best, ranking 462nd in the nation among the men the year prior. But that's why I say I felt relieved, because it made everything make sense. Um, again, nothing hateful, nothing opinionated about it, just the sheer facts of, on the paper in front of us. This was a man who went from 462nd to now dominating. And I thought the NCAA would see it how I saw it. 
again, how my parents saw it, how my teammates saw it, how my coaches saw it, how anyone with a brain would probably see this. <laughs> but the NCAA did not see it that way. They saw absolutely nothing wrong with allowing Thomas to compete with the women. And so about three weeks before our national championships in March of 2022, they announced that that would be the arrangement. There was nothing we could do about it. And so I got to personally witness and feel the effect that this infringement had, this injustice on my teammates and myself and my competitors. And I don't claim to speak for every single person on that pool deck, but I can wholeheartedly attest to the tears that I saw from the ninth and 17th place finishers who missed out on being named an All-American by one place. And I can wholeheartedly attest to the extreme discomfort when you turn around in the locker room and there's a six foot four, Wikipedia will tell you he's six one, that's a lie. Um, a six foot four, 22 year old man, fully intact and exposing male genitalia inches away from where you're undressing. And I can wholeheartedly attest to the whispers and the grumbles of anger and frustration from these girls who just like myself had worked our entire lives to get to this meet. And so that first day of competition um, was the 500 freestyle, which is not an event that I do. And so I watched on the side of the pool as Thomas swam to a national title. Again, these aren't scrubs. This is the fastest meet in the world, beating Olympians, American record holders by body lengths, which is significant because swimming is a sport that's measured down to the hundredth of a second. So to have one person beating every girl in the country by multiple seconds, that doesn't happen but it did happen. Um, that next day was the 200 freestyle, which is an event that Thomas and I raced each other in. And so we both swam prelims and we both qualified top eight. He wasn't in my heat in the morning, but we both qualified top eight and we came back that evening to race at finals. We dive in the water, we finish, we touch the wall and almost impossibly enough, we tied. So we went the exact same time down to the hundredth of a second, which is pretty rare when you're racing for a minute and 40 seconds to go the exact same time down to the hundredth, which shows me that God had his hand on it. And so we get out of the water and we go behind the awards podium where the NCAA official is standing there and typically you're handed, the, handed this little $5 production trophy and marched out into the, onto the podium and named an All-American. And so we go back there and the official looks at both Thomas, who's towering over me, and myself and says, great job, but you guys tied and we only have one trophy. So we're gonna give this trophy to Leah. Sorry, Riley, but you have to go home empty handed. And I was so taken aback by this. And I asked the question that no one had asked this entire season. And I said, why? I know we tied. I know, you know, we don't account for ties in terms of trophies but why are you adamant on giving this trophy to Thomas? And he wasn't prepared to answer this question. They didn't give him a script of what to say when someone asked why. And so he stumbled on his words and he said, uh, well, we're just doing this in chronological order. And I said, okay, G comes before T. So what are you being chronological about? And I actually appreciate his honesty because he, he looked at me and said, well, they've instructed us when pictures are being taken Leah has to have the trophy. You can pose with this one, but you have to give yours back. Thomas takes the trophy home, end of story. And that's ultimately what thrusted me over the edge because I knew all season, I knew of course the unfair competition was wrong. I knew the locker room was wrong. I knew the silencing that we were dealing with was wrong. But when they reduced everything that we'd worked our entire lives for down to a photo op to validate the feelings in the identity of a male at the expense of our own, that's when I could no longer lie because that's what they were asking us to do. When they were asking us to smile and step aside and allow these men onto our podiums, that was asking us to lie. Um, I remember the, the moment distinctly, I'm standing on the podium sharing this spot with this man, um, knowing I have to give back my trophy and he gets to take his home, which I want to reiterate, I don't even care about the stupid trophy. I'm a 12 time all American. I have lots of those at home. Um, it's not the trophy that was the problem. Of course it was the principal, but I had waited and waited for someone else to stick up for us, a coach, a parent, an official, someone with political power, someone who was supposed to be protecting us 
to protect us. But I remember the moment when it hit me that if we as women, we as female athletes, weren't willing to stick up for ourselves, how could we expect someone else to stick up for us? This has to come from us. And so, so that's what that looked like. And I know I, I briefly mentioned the locker room, but I think it's really important. We weren't forewarned we would be sharing a locker room. No one told us. Um, there was, we had no idea this would be the arrangement until we were in that locker room. And again, a six foot four, 22 year old man was undressing inches away from us. Um, it was feelings of belittlement. It's of course, it's awkward, it's embarrassing, it's uncomfortable, but really it was betrayal. And so I immediately left the locker room and went out on the pool deck and found an official and said, look, I know the guidelines for the competition, but what are the guidelines that just allowed this man into our locker room? And so nonchalantly, he just responds back with, oh, we actually got around this by making the locker rooms unisex. And so then I'm thinking to myself, okay, one, by admitting you had to change the rules, you're admitting that this isn't a woman. You, you realize that, right? And two, unisex. So any man could have walked into that locker room, any coach, any official, any parent, any man who wanted to would have had full reins to be there and bare minimum, we weren't even told about it. Um, so that's what that looked like. And so I, um, there's a lot of reporters at that meet. I think we can all agree swimming is not a sport that garners media attention, but this meet was special. Left leaning, right leaning, everything in between um, these reporters. And they were desperately hoping to get a quote or an interview with a swimmer, um, but no one would do it. My inbox was full um, of just different reporters. And so after I had kind of made my mind up that I wanted to say something, first I called my athletic director um, at University of Kentucky and I just said, hey, you know, this is what has happened. This is how we feel. How do you feel if I take a public stance and acknowledging that this is wrong? And I'll never forget, he responds back with Riley, we love you. I support you. Speak your heart, stay true to your convictions, and don't worry about painting this university in a bad light. We're behind you. But when he said that, I thought nothing of it. I thought that's how any athletic director would talk to their student athlete. So I was like, okay, thanks, bye, hung up. Um, reached back out to one of the reporters. Um, she worked at the Daily Wire. I told her the story of the locker room, the trophy, how we all felt, the general consensus of how we felt. And the story, it kind of blew up. Um, I think for a couple reasons. One of which, sports is just something that resonates with everyone. It's not boring like the economy or the environment. <laughs> And so, and two, I think people got to see the severity of what we were dealing with. Because I think when you hear the term trans woman, you think of someone who is fully committed to transitioning and who has gone through the surgeries and has computable testosterone levels to that of a woman. But we raised a man who had grown his hair out. That's what we raised. Um, and people were able to see this. And so this Daily Wire interview very quickly turned into Fox and CPAC and being pulled on stage with President Trump and all kinds of different things that by no means did I feel prepared for or equipped for. I still don't. Um, when I did my public speaking courses in college that we had to do, my face would turn the color of a tomato. Um, <laughs> but here we are. And so by no means did I feel prepared for this. Um, and it was great. I felt like I was, I was spreading the mes message and, and shedding light but I felt like I was preaching to the choir because every old man who watches Fox already agrees with me. So how could, I, how could I reach the people who don't agree with me? And that's when I began reaching out just on my own to CNN or MSNBC or some of the local stations around my hometown in Lexington. And every single one of them responded back with, sorry, but we're not gonna give you a platform to spread your hate. And this was hard for me to hear because they were actively reporting on the Leah Thomas story they were talking about it, yet I was offering to provide them per perspective of someone who was on the pool deck, yet they wouldn't consider it. And that's when I realized, I knew media, media bias existed, but this is when I realized they want us to be divided. Make no mistake, they don't want unity. Um, so I continued on kind of just saying yes to everything. Um, 
saying yes to any interview. It could be a podcast with one listener, and I was saying yes just because I wanted to put us, and when I say us, I mean female athletes, the ones I was speaking for, in a position where we couldn't continue being ignored. I pretty quickly began to feel like I was kind of just complaining. Um, my dad, being an NFL player and, and was pretty hard on us in terms of our sports and stuff growing up, he always told me it's either put up or shut up. Um, you can complain all you want, but unless you're willing to do something about it, then it's merely just complaining. Um, I was ready to do something about it. And that's when I started getting involved in making impact and making change and traveling state to state to testify on behalf of these fairness and women's sports bills that are being put forward. And now I can say just three years ago, there were only three states that had passed this bill, but now there are 22, which is great news. Um, <laughs> at the federal level, we, of course, have Title IX, which is a civil rights, uh, federal civil rights law that it prevents discrimination on the basis of sex. We have an administration in the White House right now leading this country who's rewriting Title IX to where it's no longer preventing discrimination on the basis of sex. It's preventing discrimination on the basis of gender identity. And so what this means in a nutshell, because it's broader than just sports, men can join sororities, Men would have full access to bathrooms, locker rooms, changing spaces on campus. Men could take academic and athletic scholarships away from women. Men can live in dorm rooms with women. Actually, in this new rewrite, if you were to misgender a trans identifying individual, so if I were to call Leah Thomas a he, which I do, then I'm guilty of sexual harassment. And I'm charged with sexual harassment for doing that. Not a man who's parading around our locker room exposing male genitalia, that's not sexual harassment. That's actually celebrated and encouraged. But me calling a spade a spade is sexual harassment. Um, so that's what our administration thinks of girls and women. Um, make no mistake, the message they're sending is that we don't matter, is that our privacy doesn't matter. Our safety, our fairness, our equal opportunities, our dignity, none of that matters to them. Um, along with the fairness in women's sports things, um, I've also been advocating for the Women's Bill of Rights. What this is, and I can't even believe I have to say this, what this is is a bill that defines the word woman. Um, I worked alongside lawmakers in Kansas to get it passed, being the first state, uh, my home state of Tennessee, to get it passed. I'll be going to Oklahoma next week where Governor Stitt is signing an executive order for the Women's Bill of Rights. Um, Again, crazy that we have to have a law that says what a woman is. Um, we have a sitting Supreme Court justice who can't even do such because she claims she's not a biologist. Well, guess what? I'm not a vet, but I know what a dog is. That's the most silly thing I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> um, on, top of, on top of those achievements and, and strides that are being made, um, also within sport-specific governing bodies, such as FINA. FINA is the International Governing Body of Swimming. They were the first ones to take a bold first step in acknowledging that, or I guess really prioritizing fairness. Um, they have the guideline in place now that if you've gone through male puberty, you can't compete with women. Um, same thing, World Athletics follows suit, which is track and field. Now we've just seen cycling do the same thing. Um, so, so good strides there. One more piece of this that I want to talk about, which I alluded to earlier, is the silencing that we dealt with. And I know you guys see it coming from college campuses, um, whether that be in the classroom, whatever that looks like. What I've realized is everyone has their own personal story of being affected in, in some capacity by this madness. But what we dealt with as athletes in this scenario is nothing short of, of criminal. Um, they told us we would never get a job if we spoke out. We would never get into grad school. You'll lose all your friends. You'll lose your scholarship if you speak out. This is something that will follow you for the rest of your life, and you don't want that. They told us we can't take a stance because our school has already taken our stance for us. When we were uncomfortable regarding the locker room situation, and we sent an email to our, to our administration expressing this discomfort, our administration responded back with, and I swear I have a screenshot of it, if you feel uncomfortable seeing male genitalia, 
here are some counseling resources that you need to seek. They told us that if you do speak out and any harm whatsoever comes towards Thomas's way, whether that's physical, mental, emotional, through social media, whatever harm that looks like, then you're solely responsible and you would be responsible for a potential death. And you don't want that. You don't want to be responsible for someone's death, do you? Of course not. Of course not. But that's what they said to keep us silent. They told us we would be murderers if we spoke up. Let that sink in. And that's why it seems as if I've been a lone voice and a lone face fighting for this. Because believe it or not, that's effective. It works. People set dreams for, their, for themselves and goals. Like me, dental school. When they told me I wouldn't be able to go to dental school if I spoke up, no dental school would want me, it worked. Um, but it, that's not just happening in sports either. It's happening in the media. It's happening in corporate America. It's happening in academia. It's plaguing this country, which gets to, I guess, the bigger picture of asking yourself the question, why? Why is this happening? Um, being a Christian myself, I entirely see this as spiritual warfare. It's, it's really no longer good versus bad or right versus wrong. It really is moral versus evil. And I, I look that evil in the eyes in San Francisco. And it is violent. It is vengeful. It is hateful. It is soulless. And they do it in the name of love and inclusion and acceptance and tolerance and welcoming and embracing diversity and all of these different things. But they didn't embrace my diverse thought. Um, Make no mistake, it's not loving to ask a girl to undress in front of a man. And it's not inclusive to take away girls' opportunities to compete and girls' spots on the podium and girls' roster spots. That's exclusive. Um, so in regards to the silencing and the denying of objective truth, biblical truth, the breakdown of faith the breakdown of family, the breakdown of our freedom, such as the freedom of speech, the changing of the language that we use, and peer-reviewed medical published journals, it's no longer woman or mother. It's birthing person, birth giver, cervix haver, uterus owner, menstruator, bleeder, chest feeder, um, bonus hole haver, I guess. I don't know. Um, so let me repeat. The changing of the language, the silencing, the denying of truth, the breakdown of family, the breakdown of faith, and the breakdown of our freedoms. And there's other pieces to this, such as taking of the guns, such as mandatory vaccines. This is, this is Marxism, textbook Marxism. And you open any history book and see how that turns out for any civilization, and it's not pretty. Yet the leaders of our country, this is the direction that they're taking us. Talk to someone from Germany or Russia or China or North Korea or Brazil or Venezuela or Cuba, and they will tell you what we're going through is the beginning stages, um, which should scare everyone, not to be a Debbie Downer. But that really is. That's, that's pretty chilling to think about. And it took me being directly impacted to see it. And of course, taking a step back and looking at the bigger picture. Um, and again, it's not just sports. It's happening in prisons. Men who are convicted of heinous, awful, terrible things, such as kidnapping, such as child pornography, such as rape, are realizing all you have to do to get into a woman's prison is say, I am a woman. And they're doing that. And they're getting into these women's prisons and they're impregnating women. And it's happened in Kansas, New Jersey, Ohio, California, of course. In just recent weeks, there was over 1,500 men in California applied to be women. Um, and that's not to say that all, all people who identify as trans don't struggle with gender dysphoria. But can we not acknowledge how the system that we have in place are allowing people to take advantage of it and take advantage of us as women, ultimately becoming the collateral damage in the process? Um, it's also happening in sororities. At University of Wyoming and Kappa Kappa Gamma, and again, I'll, I'll be the first to admit, I know nothing about sororities, um, but these girls, um, they've allowed a man into their sorority house who um, a lot of, he says a lot of awful, terrible things and they're going through litigation and so I'm not sure 
what parts I can release or tell you guys. But what these go girls are going through, again, is criminal. Um, and so, again, the bigger picture here is denying truth. I get called brave all the time, which blows my mind um, because I'm saying the most simple things. It's, it's something we learn in like fifth grade, right? Probably before then. Yet I get called brave and it, it strikes me. And I couldn't understand why people don't see it how I do until finally I realized that ultimately we're just scared of different things. The people who are calling me brave, understandably they're scared of the cancel culture. They're scared of the labels. And I'll say, you do get called them. I get called transphobic, homophobic, racist, white supremacist, domestic terrorist, fascist, all of them. You do, you get called them. But what's scarier to me than the labels is not standing firm in the truth. A lie will never become truth. Bad will never become good. Evil will never become moral just because it's accepted and embraced by a small portion of society. And so I'll leave you guys with, um, this conversation very quickly gets centered around girls and women. But men, you are not in the clear here. We need strong men. We have live in a society, and again, I know you guys see this coming from college campuses. We live in a society where we've deemed masculinity as toxic and bad and this undesirable trait for men to have. That could not be further from the truth. We need strong men. There's this saying, and it's hard times create strong men. Strong men create good times. Good times create weak men. Weak men create hard times. And it's incredibly interesting because you can see this process play out throughout history. And we're in the part of the process now where weak men have created hard times. I think the last time we had strong men was in the 1940s during World War II where we had men lying about their age so they could enlist in the war. And now we have men lying about their sex so they can join women's sports. It's totally upside down. And so all of this to say, be strong men, be masculine men. I'll be the first to tell you that's what every girl wants. Um, <laughs> that's what I wanted and I got one. Um, we don't want frou-frou men, we want strong men. Um, so I'll leave you guys with that. I'll open it for questions. Um, thank you. Thank you. All right. Okay, we're going to start our Q&A portion. You can line up at the back of the room right there. Um, if you'll come up and just state your name, where you go to school, and a brief question. Hi, Riley. I just want to thank you for being here and everything you've done for women's sports. My name is Kat Brimer, and I'm a proud University of Kentucky Wildcat, Cats by 90. <laughs> um, I, so my question is, I have friends who are collegiate athletes who are on full ride scholarships to D1 schools that have NII deals. And um, or and IL deals, um, but they're like worried about speaking out because if they lost their scholarship, they would not be able to continue going to school for financial reasons. So, what is your advice to them? First of all, you're wearing your Kentucky blue, and I yes. love it. Yes. Um, <laughs> schools cannot make you lose your scholarship for saying what I'm saying, um, but that I feared that I thought they could, and actually, the first time I really learned to stand up for myself in regards to um, administration at a university was during COVID. They told us, if we don't get the vaccine, you won't be able to compete. If you don't get the vaccine, um, all of these things, I mean, it's the same tactics they use in regards to, to this. But I stood firm and I said, you can't make me get the vaccine. And all of the tactics that they use, <laughs> where they told me I wouldn't be able to compete, that was a fallacy. They lied. They wanted to scare me. Um, and I will say they did. They did scare me, but not enough to, to make me, I guess, throw my moral compass out of the window. So the tactics they use, they're not real. Um, and my advice to these, to these individuals, again, 
so my team of, at University of Kentucky, uh, 40 girls, um, I was team captain, so I facilitated this conversation with my team. I wanted to make sure no one felt uncomfortable to say how they, how they truly felt. And so of the 40 girls on my team, 38 of them felt the exact same way I'm sharing. And that's not because we had 38 Republicans on our team. It was because we had 38 sensible girls who cared about excelling and achieving in their sport fairly. Um, we are in the majority in thinking this. Every poll that has come out, of course, nearly 100% of Republicans agree, but nearly 80 to 85% of independent voters agree, and 60 to 70% of Democrat voters even agree. So we are in the majority of thinking this, and so know that when you're having these conversations. Um, yeah, they, they want to deter you, they want to scare you, but the tactics, they can't, or else there are lawsuits. And we've seen a successful lawsuit in regards to this at a high school in Vermont. There's a young girl by the name of Blake Allen who felt uncomfortable undressing in front of a male. She was 14 years old on her high school volleyball team. And so she went to her administrator and expressed her discomfort, and they expelled her from school. Um, they fired her dad, who worked at the school as well, and they told her the only way we will let you back into the school is if you write a public apology and read it out loud. To which Blake said, no, I'm suing, and now she just got a big settlement. Um, so if you want to go that route and get some money, those tactics aren't real. How's it going, Riley? My name is Henry Arthur. I go to Millsaps College. Um, my question for you is, it's obvious that transgenderism and allowing men to compete in women's sports and everything else flies directly in the face of equal opportunities for women. Yet a lot of girls at my campus who say that they are feminists also support transgenderism. So how do you think that it is that feminists can on one hand say that they're fighting for equal rights for women, but then on the other hand support something that goes directly in opposition to it? We have seen this feminist movement flipped on its head entirely. Because look, before this, I never would have necessarily considered myself a feminist because my understanding of the feminist movement was they believe that men and women are the same. And while I believe that men and women are created equal, I believe we're different. And we work together in ways that our strengths and weaknesses balance each other. And so this, this but this feminist movement it's been flipped, and of course it was the Democrats who once embraced womanhood and fighting for women and femininity and all of these different things. But now, just a few weeks ago in the U.S. House of Representatives, we saw fighting for women's sports, saving women's sports, fall entirely on party lines. All 203 U.S. House of Representatives that are Democrats voted in opposition of protecting women and girls. And that right there should show you everything that, or show you everything that you need to see in regards to how Democrats really feel about us. We've even seen someone such as Megan Rapino, right? She is someone who prided herself, uh, while I agree with her on virtually nothing, um, I, she was a trailblazer for women. Um, she fought for equal pay and equal access and equal resources and all of these different things. And now we're even seeing Megan Rapino fight for male inclusion in women's sports. Notice she's retiring and she's already had her fame and success and she doesn't have a daughter to defend. But also even Billie Jean King, who is, she's who we have to accredit Title IX to. She's fighting for male inclusion in women's sports. And so I think it's just a matter of time. Unfortunately, more girls are gonna have to be injured. More girls are gonna have to be exploited in a locker room. More girls are gonna have to lose out on opportunities before these feminists, these so-called feminists and these feminist groups understand what's happening here and understand what's at jeopardy. Because if you look at this the other way, you don't see women going into men's sports. You don't see women going into men's prisons. You don't see women going into men's restrooms. And if you do see women going into men's sports, they're terrible. Um, and so I think it's just a matter of time before people, again, the feminists, realize exactly what they're fighting for People are terrified of this notion of being on the wrong side of history, which is hence the virtue signaling that we're seeing. 
but they will soon realize that they are the ones who are on the wrong side of history on this. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Ms. Gaines. Uh, I just want to say, sorry if I start tearing up a bit, this is an immensely personal topic, topic to me. I don't know if you can read this. I have Jesus' famous, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free, embroidered onto my suit, along with D-trans. I'm a D-transitioner, Ms. Gaines. I have a special relationship with the gender ideology, and I, I just want to tell you that you are not alone in this fight. You are a very, when you say you're brave, that's not an understatement. You are so brave for speaking out against this. And I actually, I wanted to play, um, I wanted to play uh, devil's advocate for a second, because I've seen numerous times from advocates on the left that Leah Thomas was an exception, that most trans athletes actually aren't hugely exceptional in the sports that they apply themselves to. And I wanted to ask, what would your response to that be? I obviously don't agree with that, just to get that on the record, but I'm curious, what would your response to that be? First of all, thank you for being here, and thank you for sharing that. Um... Really, that's, that's incredible, um, and I'm sure you, it's been a, a journey. My response to that, it's not about how good someone is. It's not about, are we only worthy as women if we're competing for a gold medal at the Olympics? Um, it doesn't matter if they are winning every time. It's about taking an opportunity away from a girl, which every male on a woman's team is doing just that, taking someone else's spot. So that's what it's about. Even in the case of Leah Thomas, who that first day won a national title, the second day placed fifth, and the last day placed eighth. It was obvious that Thomas wasn't trying. And so men have that luxury as well, especially in the case of Thomas, where they can actively give their second best and still perform better than they could in the men's category, whereas women, if the roles were reversed, we could never do that. And so to put it into perspective, again, in the sport of swimming, we train our entire lives to merely shave a few one hundredths of a second off. Um, so that, of course, is you put into it your sports specific training, but also your weightlifting, your diet, your sleep schedule, the social sacrifices, everything goes into shaving a few one hundredths of a second of a second off. And if you compare the performance gap between men and women, um, let's take the world record holder of the men's 200 backstroke versus the world record holder of the women's 200 backstroke, almost unanimously across any sport where there's an objective time and distance, such as track and field or swimming, the performance gap is between 10 and 12%, which is a huge margin when you're fighting to shave one hundredths of a second off. Um, so that argument is disingenuous and it shows what you really think about women to say, oh, well, you know, it's just, it's just middle school women's basketball, who really cares? Um, and I see that all the time when I'm testifying at the state level or federal level or whatever that looks like. And I don't think they realize how misogynistic that sounds, right? Just because we're high school volleyball team, um, is that, would you say that about a high school men's basketball team? No, of course not. Um, so the argument of, of how good they are, um, I think it's disingenuous entirely. Thank you so much. All right, this is going to be our last question. Hi, Riley. Um, I saw your interview with Jordan Peterson. I'm a big fan of Jordan Peterson, so I watch whatever videos I can of him. Um, when I heard your story, I was like, this is me. I was a cross-country track runner, but um, when I couldn't do that, I was swimming, and I had several instances of what you're talking about. When I was uh, 15 years old, I was finishing swimming. I got out, and I, went, I got changed. About 30 seconds to a minute later, a man who identified as a woman walked in, and I thought, oh my goodness, if this person had been in here a minute earlier, he would have seen me naked. And I thought, I'm not safe. Um, and so I went up to the front desk and I said, excuse me, but there's a man who identifies as a woman and um, I don't feel safe. And 
um, they said all oh, the wall, the, the the laws on 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 this person's side. I went home to my mom. My mom was of course furious, um, and um, so we've had multiple scenarios of that. Um, recently, I was working at a kids' summer camp, and it was a similar situation. But this time, I was responsible for watching 15 seven-year-old girls and a man stripped naked in front of seven of in front of these seven-year-old girls. I went to my boss. I said, "This is not safe. I don't know what to do." She went to her advisor, and um, the advisor said the laws on on that person's side. Um, and so with, with that, um, my question was, uh, as someone who, who plans on being a mother at some point, I'm very scared for where this is taking us. And I was wondering, what can we do right now to protect our children? Because I was thinking, I, as a woman, when I'm older, when I'm a mother, what am I going to do when I, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable at the moment to leave my child in the bathroom, to, to go to the bathroom ever? First of all, again, thank you for sharing that. Um, and that's what I was talking about earlier, when everyone has their own personal experience, which reminds me that mine and what we went through as swimmers is by no means unique. Make no mistake, it's happening everywhere, in every capacity, every state, um, all ages. So, so thank you for sharing that. What we can do, um, one, know where your state stands on this in regards to state legislature. Um, as I mentioned, there are 22 states, most recently being North Carolina, that have put forth the Protecting Women's Sports Bill. But know where your state stands. Contact your state representative and your state senator and let them know how you, as your constituent, feels about this. Um, so that one. Two, we can't shy away from the conversations. Too many times I see people, whether, again, it's, it's through messaging on social media, or when I see someone in public and they'll, they'll, you know, they'll briefly look around and they'll say, hey, thank you for doing what you're doing. We have to stop whispering. That's how we've gotten here, um, is because we've been quiet, we've been silent, we've allowed this to happen. We have, we've allowed the minority to, to take the public square. But we need to take the public square back because again, we are the majority in feeling this way. No sane person wants their daughter undressing with a man in a locker room. And if you do, well, then you're simply not sane, and there's another conversation that needs to be had because that's perverse, and that's disgusting, and that's sick. Um, and so understanding that we are in majority, and know it's liberating to say the truth. Once I, I, I did personally, and I knew I didn't have to adhere to the guidelines or the authority figures who were trying to keep us quiet, it felt like a weight was off of my back. It felt like, I, I mean, again, I'm saying the most basic thing. Um, it's man and woman, it's the sheer essence of humanity and they're asking us to deny that. Hate to break it to all of us in here, we're all here for man and woman. Um, and no, it's liberating to say that. Um, have the conversations with your friends. Of course, do it in a way that's respectful and compassionate and, and you can keep your composure, which I admit is hard. Um, being in situations, whether that's congressional hearings, Senate hearings, whatever that might be, and I'm sitting next to someone who has all of three brain cells, it's like, I just want to say exactly how I feel in a way that might not be effective, um, but I have to regain my composure be poised about it and communicate it in a way that is simple um, but unarguable. And the way we should frame this argument, it shouldn't be anti anything. Um, even I, I see Republican lawmakers do this where they'll, they'll say, you know, this is a mental illness. And while I do agree there is delusion there, we're not getting anyone on our side when we just claim these people are, are mental. Um, which again, there is truth to that and they do deserve mental health care. Um, but we need to make this argument pro-woman and say, ask the question that no one dares ask of what about us? What about us as girls? Because that's what the left does. They say, what message are we sending to our trans individuals, to our trans youth? Combat that with what message are you sending to girls? What message are you sending to us? Um, and so what I found is that's been the most effective way to talk about this. And so um, all of those things, plus talking about it in an effective way, it's, it's really undisputable, which is that's when 
the name calling comes in, when they can't dissuade from your argument, you will get called names, but you have to realize that it's just name calling. And at first it weighed on me, naturally, as it would anyone. Um, when people would say, you know, your hair looks like extensions, I'm like, that's a compliment because this is my real hair, I guess. Um, but it, it takes a while before you realize that the people projecting their insecurities are doing just that because they can't dissuade from what you're actually saying. They'll resort to personal petty attacks, um, which ultimately say more about them than it does about you. All right, thank you. That concludes our Q&A portion. Everyone, please give one more round of applause for Riley Gaines. Thank you, guys. Thank you. <laughs>
um, northern Macomb, northern Oakland. Um, I'm currently serving my second term, which means I'm a sophomore. I love to say that because it makes me feel like I'm young, right? Any sophomores here? You and I are like the same. Um, but I have the honor of serving on four different committees, armed services, oversight, budget, education, and workforce. I also have the distinct honor of being the conference secretary in my second term, which makes Elise Stefanik from New York um, and myself the only two women in leadership on our side of the aisle. Um, I say all of this so that you know um, my point of view as I'm talking to you today. I, I do see the world a little bit differently than most. Um, it's, it's not the normal perspective that you're going to hear from Republicans today because I see a lot of reason to be hopeful and hopeful for the future in this great country. I think the popular thing to do these days is highlight all the negatives and, and really bash the other side. And, and I don't want to downplay that because there are a lot of negatives. I mean, there's a lot of negatives going on right now. But we before we talk about hope, let's be clear about something. There are bona fide reasons to be hopeless. So I'm not going to stand up here and, and lie to you or, or paint you a rosy picture. There are a lot of reasons to be hopeless. We have a failing economy, a wide open border, radical, radical abortion policies, and foreign adversaries like China and Iran joining alliances. That's not a good thing. None of these things give us much reason to be hopeful in the future. And I think it's, un it, I think it's important to understand why. That's the key. To me, the answer is kind of simple. I, it, for those of you who know me, I'm not real fancy schmancy. Um, I'm pretty simple. To me, the other side of the aisle has sold their message better than we have. They have convinced the American public that the economy is strong, right? If you say something enough, people actually begin to believe it. They have downplayed the border crisis. They have treated the Chinese and Iranian threats as good things. How you can do that, I have no idea. And worst of all, they have brainwashed young people into thinking abortion is about health care and that you're really not killing babies. You know, it's just kind of a clump of cells, right? But they've, they've manipulated the press and they've sold their message better than we have. So think about it. Because of that, that, that simple messaging fact, they are winning and we are losing. They're not on the right side of the issues. They are certifiably crazy. I mean, you just got done listening to Riley Gaines talking about being a, a biological man competing against who? That doesn't even make sense. I mean, I, I can't even wrap my arms around that. Yet they've sold the message. And that's why they're winning because they know how to market better than we do. They don't have better messaging, they have better marketing. I know it's a hard truth to swallow. But the reality is, that's what's happening. And that's exactly why I think it's important that we and you remain relentlessly hopeful. Hope is our best selling point. And hope is something that people can actually rally around. And I'm here to tell you, Hope is what the majority of Americans want. The majority wants to protect and uphold our Constitution. And they want to ensure that the rights of law-abiding citizens are never trampled on. I stand with the majority. And I reject the 1% of the vocal minority that is trying to change our way of life and upend every promise made in the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence. I stand with the majority. Enough is enough. And we need to protect the majority, because I'll tell you right now, nobody's fighting for them. And stand up for the rights and that this country was founded on and believes in. And I'm proud to do that. But I hope every single one of you will join me. So today, I wanna talk about a few reasons 
to be hopeful and why the hope matters for the majority of this country. First and foremost, let's look at the economy. Let's just look at the facts. Biden has run our economy into the ground and it's taking some pretty heroic, her, heroic efforts to save it. Since we've gained the House, the majority in the House, and, and my, mind you, it's like a five-seat majority, sometimes it's like a two-seat majority, we've stopped Biden's reckless spending and even cut a deal to spend, to spend less this year than we did last year. That's never happened. For the first time in a long time, we actually have fiscal responsibility in Congress. Now, you don't hear about that much. We also have ensured that able bodies Americans receiving federal assistance have to work to qualify. What a concept that is, right? <laughs> Why? So they're contributing to our economy and not draining it. Because think about it. It is your economic systems that give you your social program. People, the more people we have working, I know that's kind of a bad word these days, right? The more they pay, say it with me, taxes. And just out of curiosity, what funds our government programs? Taxes, right? The government produces what? Nothing. They don't make a widget. They really don't produce anything. We are giving people a hand up rather than a hand out. And this gives us reason to be hopeful because it's laying the foundation for a strong economy. We are not there yet. But in only seven months, we've enacted conservative policies that will benefit this country for years to come. Now, something close and near and dear to your heart, let's look at education. The left has gone completely off the rails when it comes to educating our children and protecting them, right? Perhaps they should spend more time on the ABCs and figuring out our math and reading scores. Leave like the social issues and the LDGPTQRS, leave that to the parents, right? How about we focus on the job that they were hired to do and that's educate you on the fundamentals. They've lost their way. Conservatives are the only ones fighting on behalf of students instead of, te uh, of the teachers union. Think about it. The name, teachers union. Who do they represent? Teachers. So we shouldn't be shocked that they only care about teachers. Well, I'll share with you, I'm here fighting for the student, right? That's what education is supposed to do. Let's look at the facts. We actually support a parent's bill of rights and the left supports an authoritative control of the curriculum, right? I actually believe parents and students should have a say. I know that's crazy. We support school of choice so that every child gets the education they deserve. The left supports endless funding for failing schools. And their answer to everything is just give us more money. Don't hold us accountable, God forbid. Like, <laughs> that would be horrendous. We support the protection of biological women, we just heard Riley Gaines, in women's sports. And the left supports biological males competing against women. Now let's talk about this for one second. I thought this was cute. Um, I play in the congressional baseball game. Well, I run in the congressional baseball game because they're really good. But the Democrats had this uh, woman, and I think she identifies as a woman, um, on their team. And for the longest time she had, her number was the Roman numeral nine for Title IX, right? Because we fought for women and women, right? Okay, great, that's wonderful. Ironically, this year she was like number 37. I, I think that's weird, and I think that's telling. So of course I said, hey, what happened to, t what happened to the number? Why'd we change numbers? Right? She didn't flip me off this year, so that was a bonus. Um, anyways, got a little, a story got away from me. But think about it. Think about it. We are just, we're, we've just, they're just off the reservations. I mean, it's that simple. We actually stand for kids, and they don't. We stand with protecting girls, and they actually stand by exploiting them. And that's the make my own mistake. That's what they do. That's what they do. And I actually have the audacity to call them out. We actually believe that teachers should teach you 
how to think. They believe teachers should teach you what to think. It's absolutely ridiculous, and and obviously you can tell it fires me up. (laughs) But the truth is, is that conservatives have the upper hand in education. We do. Look at Virginia. But we don't win the argument. We have got to find better ways to showcase hope in our education system and point out why our policies are the best for the future of this country. And finally, let's look at limited government, which I believe in dramatically. Republicans have delivered a a few critical pieces of legislation that can change the course of history. You don't hear about them, but they're big. First of all, we have the RAINS Act. That act limits the president's authority to legislate by the stroke of his pen. And this goes for any president, Democrat, Republican, it's irrelevant. It doesn't matter. Second, we've we've done NEPA reforms so that the bureaucracy in Washington doesn't clamp down on American energy. Remember, we used to be energy independent. We aren't. These reforms give strict timelines for the permitting process and actually gives the control back to the people and away from the government. See, I'm one of these crazy people that actually believe in you all. I don't believe you need government to tell you what to do, when to do it, how to do it, what to think. I actually believe that as a parent and as an educator, that's my job is to teach you how to think, to give you the facts, and you actually can kind of make your own decisions. I actually believe you're, you're smart enough to do that, presented with the facts. But third, we've passed the National Defense, Defense Authorization Act and limited the DOD's authority to institute woke policies and their radical ideology on the military. If there was ever, ever an institution that must be free from politics, it's our armed forces. And Republicans passed a bill to do that. Right Now, these are three things in the economy. Our education, limited government, and the economy that are actually good for our country. So my question is very simple. But I want you to think about this. Why aren't we talking about it? Our side has had the bad habit of focus, focusing really intently on the policy victory and then never speaking about it. And that's why we lose. We lose because we're afraid to lead. We lose because we're afraid to get in a debate. We lose because we don't correct the truth with the other half of the truth. We have got to talk about our wins and never stop talking about that. There is always something more that we can do, but we can't forget the good things that we have accomplished. And that's where I believe all of you come into play. You, and I want you to hear me on this because this is, this is critical, you are the next generation of leaders. It's not me or anyone else in Congress. With all due respect, I'm already here. And that means I'm on the back nine. You are on the front nine. It's your opportunity and dare I say responsibility to lead this country forward and save it from a radical future. The country needs you and we need your voice. I believe we are at a critical inflection point in our nation's history similar to where we've been before. And I want you to think about this. Any history majors out there? Okay, not a lot, but thank you. Thank you. I want you to think about this. During the the revolution, when our founding fathers fought tooth and nail to, to secure our future, they had to make decisions to lead. They had to be brave and they had to sacrifice. The Declaration of Independence was a a death wish, think about this, for every man that signed it. But they did it anyways because they had the courage to lead. When Abraham Lincoln was in the midst of the Civil War and he was desperately trying to keep our union together, he went ahead and got the 13th Amendment passed through Congress that put both his career and actually his life at risk. 
but he did it anyways because he had the courage to lead. Dwight D. Eisenhower was staring down a Nazi takeover of Europe and knew action, action was needed. He led the heroic D-Day mission. Why? Because he had the courage to lead. And when the Cold War was entering the new decade of the 1980s, Ronald Reagan stepped up and negotiated with the Soviets and avoided nuclear destruction. Many thought his diplomacy was weak and that he would lead us into World War III. But he pushed ahead anyways because he had the courage to lead. And that's what each and every one of you must have right now. You are facing tough odds. You are in the minority right now because A, you're conservative at college, right? I mean, there's everything. I mean, you are clearly the minority. You are facing tough odds, and, and I know it's not easy to be a conservative and to lead. You're constantly battling uphill at your schools, many with your teachers, <laughs> and many of you with your peers, and, and, and you're written off as uncaring, mean, right? You don't care about women, you don't care, right? People call you names. I can't tell you all the names I've been called, and I'm sure you've been called a few, because of your political beliefs, even though you're on the right side. But guess what? The adversi adversity you face is, that, is really and truly not that much different than what every great leader has faced in their lifetime. Think about that for a minute. You just have to make the choice to be courageous and to be leaders. Because I will tell you, people will follow. We just have to give them a good message to follow. The fact that you're here at this YAF conference is a good indication that you are ready to lead. Now you must do is take the baton and run with it. The conservative movement needs you to have the courage to lead. And our country desperately, desperately needs it and we need you. It is your time. Be courageous and have the courage to lead. Thank you. I'm just, I'm just excited they put a box here so y'all could see me over the podium. Thank you, Congresswoman. We're going to start our Q&A section now. If you guys can line up in the middle of these two uh, rows here. And if you can come up, state your name, where you go to school, and a brief question. Mrs. McLean, my name is Ben Reese. Um, I'm a student at Franciscan University of Steubenville. I'm actually from Michigan. I am in St. Clair County. So St. Clair County. St. Clair County. Beautiful. Good good friends with Alex Samogi. I don't know if you know I him. I won't hold that against you. Yeah. Just kidding. Just kidding. <laughs> He's a great kid. Um, and uh, I had a couple questions for you about the state of Michigan's elections. Sure. Um, in the 2022 election, we saw an unfortunate um, re-election of who I think might be one of the worst governors in the United States currently, as well as the passing of ballot initiatives, one of being the pro-abortion uh, amendment, which is just an absolute disaster um, and really a disgrace for our home, con our home state of Michigan. Um, how do you think in Michigan um, we can run successful campaigns and elections um, amidst all the dirty money that there is uh, in Lansing um, especially with political action committees and uh, campaigns and elections. So um, I'm going to take a little bit of a different, a, a different um, take on that. The rules of the game apply to both sides. I'm not saying I like the rules, but the rules of the game are the same. So anybody um, a sports fan out here, like football fan, we're kind of coming into that, right? <laughs> All right. I love it when we say, oh my God, it's raining outside and um, that's gonna give you know, me an advantage. Well, it's raining for both teams. <laughs> Think about that for a second. We have got to do a better job of beating them at their own game. So one of the reasons why they won in Michigan, the Dems won in Michigan, is at the college campuses, right? They put the abortion law 
and, and the election law, and they marketed the bejesus out of it, right? Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. Um, they marketed it. Then what did they do? They went around to college campuses, registered everybody, and they had lines outside the door. They were mobilized, they were organized, and they kicked our butt because of that. Now, where I get angry is we can sit and complain about it, or we can actually step up and do the same doggone thing, but we don't. We have to. We have to get organized. We have to get mobilized. And we have to begin to play at the same level it says they do. We could have done that same thing. We just chose not to. This is not the time to sit idle on the sidelines. And that's what I'm imploring all of you to do. Don't stand there. Don't be silent. And don't sit idle, which you're not doing from being here. But that's what we have to do. We have the ability to, same the, to raise the same money. We just take the righteous road, okay? We have the same ability to get people organized and registered to vote. We just don't. We just don't. We have the same opportunities for us. We have got to begin to take them if we want to save our state and save our country. I didn't mean to yell at you. Sorry, my mama bear came out. Hi, my name is Dolan Bear. I go to Wheaton College in Illinois, but I also live in Michigan, like the previous guy. And I worked for uh, John Molinar, who's another congressman there. Nicest man in America. Yeah, he's, he's great. Um, and you had talked about policy victories, and we have an election coming up for Senate in Michigan. Um, do you think it's worth uh, running more of a moderate candidate who has some policy victories or more of a true conservative candidate that has a lesser chance of winning but will have a lot of policy victories? I, um, I don't think it matters. I really don't think it matters. So let's look at Alyssa Slotkin who's running. Alyssa Slotkin talks about being this moderate candidate. I mean, and, and I use her as a noun. But in Michigan, she's this moderate candidate. Go check her voting record. She's about as moderate as, well, she's not moderate. Let's just go put it that way. Go check her voting record. She is about as progressive as they come, yet she markets herself as a moderate. Save it. Give me a break. But it doesn't matter. It matters how you market yourself. Don't let the facts get in the way of a good story. So I don't really, I think it's, I, I think it's less about the candidate, because let's be honest, you have to be, uh, if we did our job, we'd clear the field for our candidate, right? And then we'd spend a ton of money marketing, because in the primary, you have to be more conservative. But let's be honest, Michigan is a purple state, really bordering on blue, right? So you just got to market better the, than the other team. Did that answer? not from Michigan or have any Michigan ties, you don't get to answer, ask a question. I'm kidding. Hi, Lisa. My name's Jack and I'm from the UK. <laughs> <laughs> you may laugh, but we've got a king, you've got a court jester for your head of state. <laughs> Anyways, to business. My party believes in what you believe in. High growth, low tax and secure borders. Reform UK, formerly known as the Brexit Party, Nigel Farage. My party is against central bank digital currency. What is yours and your party's stance on central bank digital currency? The biggest issue I think we have is the dollar and the value of the dollar, right? That, God bless you, that gives us our economic and our competitive advantage is that the dollar. The United States, I'm talking selfishly, I'm talking about the, the United States. I don't like it, I wanna keep the dollar. I wanna keep the dollar as the world currency because that's what gives us our competitive advantage. You're looking like that didn't answer your, your question though. No, do, do you know what central bank digital currency is? I do. Okay. So do you believe in central bank digital currency or are you against it? I believe, one, that we have to have 
a currency that works for our country. So I look at it from the perspective of the United States of America. You can do what, what you want, and I don't mean this you personally, overseas, but for me, the only currency I care about is the US dollar. And, and I'm not saying that to be rude or disrespectful, but I wanna win, and for the United States to, to have its upper hand, I want the US dollar. You guys do whatever you guys wanna do over there. That's your, that's your business. My business is I want to keep the dollar number one. Yeah. With all due respect, sorry. Uh, hello, I'm Kess Hussain, I'm 19. I'm also from the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland. Um, firstly, I would like to thank you and offer my gratitude. No, 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 no. I'm not going to be indecorous towards her. I actually, I, you I'm... can be, but see, but here, one second, sir. Okay. Here, here's where I'm at. Disagreement isn't disloyalty. I want you to, be, to debate with me. Debate respectfully, right? But, de but think about this. Debate either makes me stronger in my position and stronger in my beliefs, or it gets me to think, wow, I didn't think of it that, from that perspective, right? And I begin to see things from another's point of view. So debate is not bad. Disagreement is not disloyalty, provided it doesn't get personal and we stay with the facts. See, the problem with, peop with people when they debate, if they can't debate me on the issues, they turn it to emotion and they make it personal. That's when I know I've won. So disagreement isn't disloyalty, sir, so bring it on. Okay. Well, I was actually going to offer you my gratitude. Thank you for uh, offering respect and sharing condolences when we lost our late sovereign in September. I read your tweet, so thank you for that. It meant a lot to us in Great Britain. You met our former Prime Minister, Liz Truss, in December. Yes. She was defenestrated by the woke warriors, by the blob, because she believed in low taxation. She believed the way that we can save ourselves from the cost of living crisis to grow it. And then, obviously, we have a new Prime Minister who I don't like, who President Biden calls Rashid. Rashid doesn't even call him by his proper name. Uh, um, Winston Churchill coined the relationship between Great Britain and America as a special relationship, and Ronald Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, Baroness Thatcher, were hand in glove together. But currently, we have a pre your senior president who hates Britain. Uh, he's lost. We're losing Northern Ireland, which has just become the EU's first colony. He hates Britain, everything we stand for. How can we make sure Britain and America solidify our love together and we be strong together? And how how we as conservatives share the messages? in America and in the UK. We got to get better leaders. And, and, and of, I mean, there is no other way. Look at Reagan, look at that, uh, Margaret Thatcher, right? They were courageous leaders. I mean, when, when Margaret Thatcher um, went up against uh, um, the unions, the coal, the coal, I mean, t trust me, that wasn't super popular, but she had the courage to lead. She stood up against the union barons. The unions, the yes. The Britain, exactly, exactly. And she had the courage to do that. Even though she was getting her butt kicked, it wasn't popular. She had a lot of negativism, negativity thrown at her. She did it because she believed in her heart of hearts that was right. You're not going to get that relationship back, in my humble opinion, until we get different le leaders. End of, end of story. Uh, hello, uh, Congresswoman. Congresswoman, uh, thank you so much for being here to speak with us. Um, my name is Sean Kim, and I currently graduated from Sonoma State University. Uh, my question to you is: In the future, I want to become a congressman, and what uh, advice can you give to me or others who may have the same goal? Uh, I think there's three things that it takes to win. One, you have to be a good candidate. Okay, well, really, what does that mean? What that means is you have to have a good message. You got to know a lot about a little, right? No, excuse me. You got to know a little about a lot, right? Because in my job, I have to understand 
economics. I have to understand health care. I have to understand foreign policy. I have to understand um, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, health care. There is so much on a daily basis that you need to know. You don't need to know it in depth, right? But you need to understand it conceptually. So you have to be a good candidate, which means you have to study and you have to know the issues. Second, which I think is actually most important, this is the how, you got to have a good message. If you don't have a good message, no one is going to vote for you. No one. And you got to be able to have the courage to talk about that message and get heckled about that message. And you have to have some really thick skin because if I, people, again, can't beat you on the issues, they are gonna come after you and your family personally and they are gonna attack you, but who cares? Because that tells me I am kicking your butt, right? So you have to have a good message, right? Think about it in, um, um, in food, right? We, if you don't, you can have an average product Right? I, think, I think some products are average out there, but they market it really good and they, can, and they sell. That's way better than having a phenomenal product that nobody knows about. You gotta use your voice. And the third thing I hate to say, you gotta be able to raise a ton of cash. It, now, I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying that's the way it should be, but I live in the reality of the world. And right now, that's reality. So you got to be able to go into a room and have a presence and talk to people and have an internal passion. People will know in two seconds. You got to be able to market and you got to be and you got to have cash. Good luck. Hello, uh, my name is Caleb Nunez um, from Northwestern. And speaking of a change in leadership, uh, Lee Stefanik has a 41% rating from the Club for Growth as her lifetime rating. In fact, there were a couple years that Ilhan Omar had a higher score than her. Uh, would you be willing to challenge her for her chair spot in the Republican conference? <laughs> oh, I think Elise does a good job as conference, uh, conference chair. Where I'm at, I'm not much for Republican on Republican um, um, crime, so to speak. I don't know how to say that. Um, um, Elise's job as conference chair is to market. She's done a good job, at least from the, listen, I have a, a, an extensive two and a half years it, it, um, experience. But with that, I have two and a half years of experience. So I think there's a lot to learn from people, not only on what they do right, but sometimes more importantly on what they do wrong, right? There's a lot of lessons that you can learn from your mistakes, right? If you talk to my husband, I'm perfect, but I've made a, uh, made a lot of mistakes. The answer to your question though is I do wanna move up in leadership, and I think life's a matter, of, um, a matter of timing, and I never close any door, right? So I can't tell you my next goal is to take Elisa's spot or to, to be Speaker of the House or to be Governor of Michigan. Or My goal in life is to always be prepared for the next opportunity that asserts itself. I never know when that next opportunity is. I never, ho I I never know how the moons are gonna align, but I can guarantee you this, sir, I will be prepared for whatever opportunity comes my way. And if I, if I decide to go, I will go all in. That was a tough question too. That was a good one. Hi, my name is Andrew Fromel. I am a student at the University of Iowa. I have seen some concern recently that House leadership is trying to slow walk the release of the 12 appropriations bills so that spending might possibly go over the agreed upon spending limit. Will you and your fellow House conservatives be willing to shut down the government to ensure that we stay below the agreed upon spending limit to ensure that we have fiscal stability for the future so the future generations are not saddled with debt? So I'm gonna answer your question, but I think I'm gonna challenge your premise. You made a statement that the House leadership is trying to slow walk the appropriation bills. 
Based on what? I just saw some articles that they're like trying to trickle out like a couple at a time now and then there's going to be... Who wrote those articles? I just saw that they're like trying to do a couple and then that there's going to be a break and then they're going to try to cram like nine more through right before the October 1st deadline. So, um, one, I don't think that's true. We've passed... Is it nine of the 12 appropriation bills have gone out of committee? We're bringing two to the floor this week. If we, um, without getting too technical, part of what our conference did at the beginning of the year was put rules and regulations in place that you had to have three days to look at the bill before you voted on the bill, because we actually wanted to be able to read the bill as opposed to pass it in the dead of night. So we got here on Tuesday, we leave on Friday. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, right? That's four days to put nine appropriation bills. There's, there's just not enough one floor time to do that, number one. Number two, we have this thing called an open amendment process, which is very, very different than we've ever had before, which means that if my, my amendment is germane and it's single subject, I can or anyone can offer that amendment on the floor. And as you know, those amendments need to be debated. They, they need to be voted on. That all takes time. And the only thing we can't make more of is time. So we might have, like for the NDAA, we had 1,500 amendments. A, you got to debate those amendments. B, you got to vote on those amendments. That all takes time, and you got to have time to process them. So I, I take a little bit of issue with we're slow walking. Um, we're slow walking. Maybe that's what it appears, because that's the rules of the game that we set up, right? Now, will we pass all 12 appropriations bills? I doubt, be, be, before September, I doubt it. I think we'll pass... The majority of them, I don't want to. I don't have a crystal ball, um, but that's why we're bringing them to the floor right now. The first, usually, how it works is we pass a big omni or we do a CR. I can assure you, we're not going to get into a long-term CR, but I can assure you, we've all already with the appropriations bills that we have gone through committee are funded at less than last year's numbers and even less than what we expected, right? So you have the 1% reduction. A lot of those uh, appropriation bills are actually even less than that. I mean, we have made some severe cuts. One thing I would share with you, do a little bit more research than just the headline in the paper because there's a, there's a lot more that goes into the making the sauce of slow walking the bills. I wouldn't say we're slow walking anything. I think we're following due process. And that's why we've been here, um, like I've been home like maybe two weeks in the past four months. I don't think we're slow walking anything. Um, so I, I don't, I disagree with that premise, but I don't think we're gonna shut the government down. And I think we're not gonna shut the government down because you look at the Thomas Massey bill, you familiar with that amendment that got in the debt ceiling? It said that if we don't pass all 12 appropriation bills, if we don't pass them, an automatic 1% cut will go into effect, automatically. We all voted for that, that's, that's given. So if we don't pass all 12, automatically, 1% cut. So the Dems and the other side can't use the fact of, oh my God, you're going to shut the government down. You're going to shut the government down. And as, and, and, and as a thing, just as a side note, what does shut the government down mean? I mean, you're going to hear, oh my God, you're gonna, nobody's going to get the social security check. Wrong. Wrong. Everyone's going to get their social security check. Wrong, don't let the facts get in the good way of a good story. Oh my God, we're not gonna be able to get their military benefits. Wrong. Don't believe everything you read in the media because they don't know what they're talking about half the time. So I don't think the government will shut down. I don't think we'll pass all 12 before um, uh, the end of September, but I think we'll pass maybe nine of them. And again, think of what happens. We have to pass the appropriation bills to get into conference, right? To give McCarthy a hand to negotiate with to pass a good bill. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay.
All right, that's going to conclude our Q&A portion. Thank you, oh Congressman, God. for being with us today. And, uh, Can we just take one more? Oh. Yes. If you guys can't figure it out, I like I'm sorry, but we're really out of time. Everyone, please give her one more round of applause. Thank you very much. Thank you. pleasure of introducing our next speaker, a personal favorite of mine, John Lovell. John is the founder and CEO of the Warrior Poet Society, a values-based community dedicated to physical protection, the pursuit of truth, and living for higher purpose. Having served in the 2nd Ranger Battalion, he's a former war veteran and special operations soldier. After his military service, he served as a Christian missionary in Central America. I hope you're ready to hear some hard truths, some good dad jokes, and some great advice. Please give a rowdy gaff welcome to John Lovell. Thank you, thank you. Today I'm going to be fiercely practical. I'm not a politician, I'm not running for political office, I don't need any of your votes. And so I'm just gonna say whatever I want. And so they had me here last year at a rip-roaring good time. We're gonna do it again this year. And maybe, just maybe, they'll even invite me back. But I have this habit of saying exactly what I think. And I didn't want to just do some kind of political pep rally. We all get jazzed up, but then we leave and we're not really sure what to do about it. I wanna give you stuff that you can actually do when you leave. Wouldn't that be nice? I, for one, I, I feel helpless a lot because I feel like my country is just going down in flames. My way of life, the values that I absolutely adore and live and, and one day will die by are just getting trampled on in the public square and I feel like I can't do anything about it. You know, I don't want to just be told of like, call your congressman, vote red, you know, like I, what can I do? You know, and that, that's kind of what I feel like. And so we're talking about freedom today. And I want to talk about how you can seize your freedom. My wife and my kids and I were at the Korean Memorial yesterday, which is really awesome. I, we saw the Vietnam before. They really got more budget for the Korean Memorial. That has nothing to do with anything. But I was there and it said etched right there in the memorial, freedom is not free. You know that already. Freedom's not free. Now, this is something that's crazy because this is dawning on me over the last week. Um, I, I, before I thought of like, okay, freedom isn't free. That means soldiers go and they fight. And if they do well, I get to be free. You get to be free, right? Because soldiers fight for it, right? Well, you also have to fight for your own freedom. Th this should be a little bit revelatory for you of like, no, no, no. Freedom is no like real guarantee for you personally. You have to grow into your own freedom. Think about it, you started as a baby. How much freedom do babies have? 
None, you just stay there, throwing up on yourself, blinking like a, a, a little fat slug, you know? I, I adore babies, by the way. I used to be one. I used to be one, just thing. But this is how dudes, men's men, talk about babies. So it is with endearment that I, talk, I call them little fat blinking slugs. I love them as I even say it. But you don't have much freedom. You're a fat little baby. You can't do anything, right? Then you grow up and you, you gain some freedom. One day you can drive and you're like, yeah. The world is mine. I'm free, baby. You know, but you're super broke. And so you can just like drive around a little bit and then you go back home. I have no money. I'm not free to live the life that I want to do. And you, you feel like, oh, if I just keep getting older and I keep getting more response, but then I can gain more and more freedom. And that's what you want, right? Freedom is something that we have to earn. It's something we have to pursue. It doesn't mean your life is free of suffering. We have this entitled perspective in America that if I'm free, then everything's just handed to me. And that's such a spoiled and idiotic, naive notion. Let me just tell you plainly, as if I speak any other way. Freedom just means that you're uncapped. It means that you got this clear horizon of opportunity, but you gotta get out and earn it. You gotta grow. It's as if here in America, we should be uncapped in our freedom of opportunity. That's all you got is the freedom of opportunity to grow more and more free. This whole speech is about how you grow from where you're at now to becoming a more and more free individual. You're not as free right now as you could be. I'll tell you how, but you're not as free right now as you could be. Now, if you grow in personal freedom, then you're able to help other people grow in their freedom, and then you're able to help protect a whole nation's freedom. But it's not just by default. You gotta suffer. You gotta fight for it. You gotta be wise. You gotta be long suffering. And that's how we earn freedom. Today, I wanted to talk about uh, four different types of freedom that we need to grow into. One is financial freedom, two is physical freedom, three is spiritual freedom, and four is mental freedom freedom or psychological freedom. These are in no particular order, but that's uh, how I'm rolling. And so uh, buckle up. There is this old picture I saw. I looked for it on the internet. I couldn't find it. And then I gave up because I hate the internet most of the time. Uh, but there's this picture of a lion and he's in a cage. And then there's a lion, you know, out on the, the savannah, you know, prowling and doing lion stuff. And then the caption said, one of these lions is guaranteed safety and food. And the other one is guaranteed nothing. But one lives in a cage, right? One is given all of its needs and it just lays there being a lion, posing for, you know, I guess it's not selfies because the lion doesn't take the same. Posing for pictures, right? Uh, but it's not free. Now, a lot of young people are lulled into thinking that the zoo would be a nice place. How cool would it be to just be taken care of by the zookeepers? And it kind of has some perks. Kick up your lion feet. That's a weird thing to say. Kick up your paws <laughs> and allow all your needs to be met. And maybe that'll feel pretty good until one day you want to actually get out a little bit, stretch and see what else is out there, right? But you can't leave. And then lots of other people crowding in to this kind of system. Uh, you can see with this entitled living where you're not free, the zoo becomes overwhelmed. And then there's not as much food and conditions get really, really bad. And this is just a cautionary tale of what socialism does. And it can be absolutely terrible. Uh, for most of human history, the king owned the land. The king owned all the land and everybody else lived on land. They had to give fealty or tribute or, you know, your uh, work in land and paying taxes. But the king owned all the land. And it was pretty revolutionary when colonists from England came over to the new world in search of a greater freedom that was unrealized from the place they came from. Now they're able to kick up a, a little homestead, which they build themselves and hope that Indians don't come and murder them in their sleep. Uh, and that they don't die of pestilence or famine or anything else like that. It was hard. And a lot of civilizations, uh, early colonies in America just disappeared. It turned out a lot of us kind of sucked at growing food and you needed food to survive apparently. And so it was hard in early America. 
Uh, so much so that some of these civilizations were rescued by Indians because they came in and I'm like, hey, you guys kind of suck at farming, don't you? We're pretty good. And then they rescued them. <laughs> and so that was really, really good. But notice they had the freedom to be able to carve out and eke out a life for themselves. And they, they found that freedom to be absolutely essential. Now, for you guys, I listed four different ways that I want us to grow in our personal freedom. Let's seize freedom today together. One is financial freedom. Uh, there is debt. This is how corporations enslave you. And then there's taxes, and that's how governments enslave you. Corporations would like to enslave you by having you run up credit card debt. Now you're paying them interest forever. It's like, how free are you? when you're working three jobs just to make ends meet. You can't afford to go and do anything. How free can you really say you are, right? That, that's not freedom. You're a slave to those jobs. And so being able to save your money uh, and to be able to avoid debt allows you to have the freedom to do what you want with your life. But you can be free politically, you can live in the land of the free and the brave, but you can be so eaten up by debt that you, you can't do anything with your freedom. You're not free. You're killing yourself just to stay alive. And that is the truth and reality for many people. Taxes are also awful. Did y'all know that? Some of y'all haven't really, like you paid a little taxes. You, you know, you're like junior varsity taxes. And as a guy who's like varsity taxes, taxes are awful just miserable of like 50% of your realized income in one way or another is going to the government, whether it's income tax and you got a property tax and your cell phone has a tax and everything has taxes attached. And if you added it all up, even if you're a lower tax bracket, you may really be paying about 50% of all of your money to taxes. I'm a little higher than that. Think about that. That means you go to work all year and January, February, March, April, May, June. All of it was so the federal government can teach gender studies in Pakistan. <laughs> Taxes. You know, so I'm still irritated by that. Of like, yeah, let's send everything to the Ukraine. Let's do, you know, like just wild spending, right? Half the year just goes to paying taxes. At what point? So uh, Andrew Claven. He is a contributor to their Daily Wire. He said something uh, to the effect of, uh, you trade your time for money. When they take your money, they take your time. And when they take your time, they take your life because your life is just made up of time. Do you see it? Right now, say you're at 50%, but what if they did more? 60, 70, 80, 90, 100. Now it's Marxism, pure Marxism. Everything is owned by the government. Are you free? Only in name, they own everything. I'm so irritated about property taxes. Like, if you own your house, you still have to pay property taxes forever. And they say, oh, no, it's like for sewer and roads. I'm like, no, I already pay municipal, local, state, and federal taxes and a bunch of other. I'm already paying that. What is a property tax? Except, if, like, do you really ever own your home in America? You got it all paid off, it's yours, and every single year, if you don't give the federal government money, they can take it from you. And if you're like, I'm not doing that, eventually someone with a gun will show up and put you in prison. Is it really your land anymore? Anyway, that's a little bit of a tirade. I'm very upset about it. Uh, but boo for debt and boo for taxes. Save your money and gain financial freedom. Copy? Is this helping anyone? Yeah. Don't be financial slaves. Number two, physical freedom. Uh, how many of y'all have seen the Sound of Freedom movie? No kidding. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I wept through that movie, and then I, I vacillated b uh, between absolute tragic heartbroken to furious rage. But if you stayed to the very end of the movie, it pointed out that today we have more slaves in our modern world than we ever have before in history. Sexual slavery is out of control. And who is the biggest purchaser? Who's the biggest consumer of sexual slavery? America. We have replaced Islam, who have been sexually enslaving people for centuries and centuries, right? Still today in some Middle Eastern countries, slavery is legal and they're doing that. 
China still has slaves. Uh, effectively, the Congo mining all of our lithium for our electric cars and our phones and stuff, and I'm guilty here, of there are slaves all over the place, and this is physical freedom must be combated. Uh, we would like to lull us to sleep of like, oh, we beat that, and we're so progressive. No, I can't think of any crimes of the pagan world that we're not doing today. Murdering our children. It did, we're no better. We're not getting better as people. And again, this is a tirade. Somebody gave me a microphone, and I just say what I want. Modern slavery is an abomination. It is outrageous, and it needs to be combat combated. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> Ultimately, the only way to really keep ourselves from sliding into one form of slavery into a worse form of slavery. Anybody know what it is? <laughs> that would be nice, but no, that is incorrect. Uh, Mao Zedong would say all ultimate power derives from the barrel of a gun. It's by force. That's it. All power ultimately comes from force. And the founders, realizing they wanted to create a free country, freedom of speech, freedom of assembly. We're doing that thing. Way to go, founders. That's awesome. Freedom of religion, freedom of the press. And you're like, yeah, we'll give them all these freedoms. And I'm like, you know the tyrants will rise up and take it away, right? And they're like, ooh, that's right. Well, rule number two, let's give them guns. Yay, guns. <laughs> that's it. That's it. Unfortunately, it is the only fail-safe to a republic that you would like to keep and stay free. It's firearms, that's it. Never ever give them up. If you do, you are ultimately giving the keys to your own freedom away, and one day, you're gonna need those keys. Whoa. It's true, Whoa. it's true, it's just true. <laughs> it is absolutely true. So uh, make sure we're exercising our Second Amendment. It was given so that the government would not have a monopoly on force. Right now, despite all the propaganda going on in the media and all the social media influencers that are paid by the administration to say anti-gun things and all the power grabs that are happening, all of it is designed so that you would be disarmed. The government has a monopoly on force. And as soon as the government has full monopoly on force, they can do whatever they want. They're already starting to, aren't they? they do whatever they want rampant corruption everywhere. And you're like, isn't anyone going to do anything? No, it's hopelessly corrupt. Would you like to give them their, your guns now? Don't be a coward, folks. Never give up your guns. Bury them if you have to. Never give them up. Uh, third way that we can uh, gain uh, our physical freedom, homestead. This is a weird one. This is a weird one. You're smiling. You're like, I am already homesteading. Good for you. Way to go. Ultimately, Homestead, it's to be able to control your life, your money, where you live, all of your food. Imagine grocery stores shut down or you're in China and you have social credit scores and they don't like what you said on Twitter or they don't like what you're saying at work and they're like, let's just turn this joker's bank account off, let him starve for a week and then we'll see how his attitude and disposition is. They can't cut off your bank account. You don't need your bank account. You grow your own food. You got goats and you got cows and stuff. And now because they can't turn off your food and they can't control you that way, you can stand on principle. Imagine that you're so financially constrained and physically constrained, so dependent on spending money in a bank uh, or getting that paycheck week to week that you wanna stand for freedom but then you realize if you do, your family doesn't get to eat anymore. How boldly can you stand for your principles of freedom now? And really you can't. And it's because you weren't free enough physically and you weren't free enough financially. When we're more free financially and when we're more free physically, like a homestead, you're far less likely to be bullied. I'm impervious to it. What are you gonna do? If like shut off my bank account, I don't need money anymore, I have a homestead. No food of like, I've got years of food stored at my house because I'm a crazy guy. <laughs> you know, I, I say crazy, but if, it, to look at the news and see the trend, to see the obvious writing on the wall and still think it's not a good idea to gain some personal autonomy and self-sufficiency, you're a moron. I can't help you. I cannot help you. That is idiotic to me. No, gain some self-sufficiency. If you don't need it, no big deal. If you do need it, well, then you get to survive. 
This all sounds sensationalistic, but I'd remind you that the real length of any free country, any republic, any democracy is about 250 years. You know, we're closing in. And no country ever sees its own decline. They never saw it therein. The great mighty Roman Empire in all of its pomp and glory, much like an ancient America, never thought it could fall. And even after it had already fallen, according to historians, still people were continuing to live in that society. And I see a precipitous decline. Now, you know a country is coming unraveled and meeting its end before it's just gone altogether or it revolves into some other kind of entity. The decay is a slow thing, and at the very end, there's a picking up. There's an unraveling. It, everything happens so fast. Do y'all remember what the major headline was two weeks ago? Of course you don't. It dominated the news cycle for like a week. Every week there's something so outrageous. A few things, you can't even keep track of it anymore. I forget all the outrageous stuff. It's unraveling at the seams. I think that you should make small steps starting now to be financially free and to be more physically free. Homestead. Also another thing uh, in the physical freedom category is health. Uh, don't pop pills and get weird shots from Big Pharma who wants you to be sick and eat poisonous food. I, I like doing the homestead thing because I know what's in my food. I'm like, these eggs are good. My chickens laid these eggs this morning. They're good, you know, and I'm not getting poisoned by trash food. Uh, third thing, spiritual freedom. I was reading in Romans 6 this morning uh, that you're either a slave to sin or you're a slave to to righteousness. That means you got all these appetites and desires and all these wrongdoing things that you're uh, engaged in, and you're a, really a slave to it. You'd like to be better. Everybody knows that there is a right and wrong, and everyone also knows that you trespass, you violate your own conscience even in that respect. So even if you're not a believer, you recognize, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm not living how I should be living. But us more discerning will even recognize, yeah, you're either a slave to doing the right thing or you're a slave to doing the wrong thing. And that's the whole point of Romans 6. It's true. It's true. Uh, John 8, Jesus says, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. There he is. He's talking about freedom. It's like, no, 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 your souls are in bondage. They're in turmoil. You are a slave to your appetites and your addictions and your selfishness and your sin. And because of it, you are going to destroy your own life. It's happening now. It's already starting with your rebellion, your pride, your anger, your selfishness. You're going to destroy your own marriage. One day your kids may not be able to stand you anymore. You won't even like you anymore. But you're a slave to our own sin and we're all destroying ourselves. And what can happen is we can immediately pick up from that track and go a completely different direction by saying, hey, not my will be done, but God's will be done. And as Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. You can say, what is the truth? And Jesus said, step forward and say, I am the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father except through me. And so what we ultimately want... What we ultimately want is freedom. And the most important freedom you can have is a spiritual freedom. A spiritual freedom. That means it doesn't matter really what happens on this, uh, on this rock of an earth. I'm just passing through like a sojourner. Uh, because my ultimate destination is not of this world. And I know what is right and I know what is truth. And so as the morally relative world vacillates one way and the next of what they believe is right and wrong with this really set up false virtue, I get to stand firm and say, no, I know exactly what right and wrong is. I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to do that either. And I'm not moving. You can't intimidate me. You can't bully me because the righteous is bold as lions. Right now, the world is deceived into thinking Right is wrong and wrong is right is amazing with this radical woke left ideology. Everything they say is evil, I, th I say is good. And everything I say is good, they decry as evil. 
It's a false and counterfeit virtue. And I'm sick of it. Uh, uh, Spiritual freedom can also set you free from the trap of moral relativism. Think about it. If there is no God, then morality is just made up stuff. Whether it's social contract or whether you individually make it up, it's all just make-believe. It's all just a noble lie. It's baseless. There's no such thing as right or wrong. If there's no moral law giver, there's no actual real moral law. And so one culture says, hey, this is wrong. And the, the, another culture says, no, that's right. That's, this is right. And, and so they disagree completely. Who are you to say that culture is right and that culture is wrong? Morality is just made up by men. Right? So you can't really even say anyone's morally right or wrong. This is moral relativism, and it's a humanistic trap that people are stuck in now, right? Uh, But we're set free from moral relativism uh, because we know that uh, God is there, and he has declared what is good and what is evil, and we're to follow the good and not the evil. The fourth thing I want to talk about is mental freedom. Uh, To be mentally free, to be psychologically free, you have to be educated. Uh, my wife and I and my kids, we were just in Egypt on a warrior poet trip. Fantastic time. But we're going through some of these markets, and we saw all these people selling like the same goods. You know, they got this little Phoenix, uh, uh, Sphinx statue. I'm like, oh, that's really cool the first time you see it. But then, like, we're there for like a week, and everyone's got that same little Sphinx statue. Authentic Egyptian? Made in China. <laughs> so, you know, but of like we went through one place. This was a Valley of the Kings, wasn't it, baby? It was Valley of the Kings, and we went through this narrow marketplace, and there was, I don't know, like 50 different shops, and everyone's crowded in, and they're all holding up and peddling their wares, and all of the little statues and figurines were exactly the same. And they were aggressive. They were desperately trying to get us to do this, and they didn't have any real way to make a living. They didn't have an education. We also visited this little carpet making shop and there were these little boys and teenager and grown men. It's like you could see their whole life in one one glance. Little boy, teenager, grown man. And all they did is they just built these little carpets all day long, all day long, calloused hands. Uh, It was real sweet. My boys sat beside them and learned their craft and just had a sweet little moment uh, that broke our hearts. But I recognize these people in this particular impoverished era, they're, they don't have the education to be able to break out of this cycle. What would I do if I was there? I'm like, I'd do the same thing. I'm like, education can set you free in a way. Now, notice I don't mean schooling. Unfortunately, the best way to get an education is get away from stupid schooling. So the government schools, they're not educating you. They're doing the exact opposite. They're indoctrinating you. They're making you stupid. Have you seen common core math? or the radical historical revisionism. It's appalling. It's um, unbelievable to me, unbelievable to me that basic critical thinking, logic, rhetoric, semantic, sales, how to do taxes or read contracts, know how to do insurance, all the stuff you need as an adult, none of it is taught in school. Just none of it. You're just wasting a bunch of time learning about weird gender ideologies and stuff. You're becoming stupider. Uh, now, so I'm an employer. If you count up all Warrior Poet Society's employees of 1099s and W-2s, uh, we're like 25, you know, folks in our enterprise. The main work's kind of like 12, 14, 15 something, but like 25. When I see a liberal arts degree on a resume, it now counts against you more than it helps you. I'm not discouraging you to go on to lower education so you can get woke, entitled, and rail against capitalism. (laughs) Isn't that funny? You graduate from liberal arts hating capitalism, and I'm supposed to hire you so you'll secretly root against my company? That's insanity. Now, it's not all liberal. I have a liberal arts degree, uh, and you may too, and maybe yours is a good one. Um. But I'm just saying, now I lean in. I'm like, all right, how woke is this person? How, how crazy is this person? Um, and so, like, do they know what bathroom to use, for example? And these are my private thoughts. There's all kinds of laws that we're, we're following regarding uh, hiring and firing. And I don't hire anyone. I have other people that do that now. But I'm just saying, when I see a liberal arts degree, I think worthless, entitled, woke, obnoxious punk. Did you just get embarrassed for me? 
<laughs> That's awesome. Uh, it doesn't mean you can't go. You want to be a doctor, a lawyer, an engineer. You got to go to school. You got to do that. So don't hear me saying you shouldn't go to college. You might. And you also might not. I see a lot of absolute worthless wastes of time where you're accruing massive amounts of financial loan and you can't ever get rid of it. You can you could declare bankruptcy, which wipes the whole docket clear of all your debt unless it came from the federal government. And then that hundred, two hundred thousand dollars of federal student loans, you can never get rid of it. It's always there, hanging over you to enslave you financially. Be very careful accepting financial aid. It's not your friend. And the degree might not be worth the paper it's printed on. Uh, let's keep going. I am uh, wrapping up. and oh, We're going to do it on time. That's fantastic. So we've got mental freedom in review. We've got financial freedom, physical freedom, spiritual freedom, and now we're in psychological freedom. I mentioned education, which is not the same as schooling. Uh, read lots of books. Uh, make sure you're interning for good companies. Find good mentors. Follow them around. That's the classical way that you get a good education. Don't just go to the government school and think the state is going to give you the tools to challenge it later. Uh, beware news, legacy news. There are full propaganda machines owned by globalists that hate you. Uh, also, beware social media. It's finely tuned with AI and uh, artificial intelligence and algorithms to manipula manipulate you away from the worldview you currently hold to one that's antithetical to your values. It starts off, you're, vote, you're watching what you want and then little crazy weird cat videos and then half naked chicks twerking on TikTok or whatever what? that is. And then before you know it, no, that's not a cheer point. <laughs> it's, it's not, we're not cheering for that. We're, we're, have you said TikTok is off? I, I'm not on it, but uh, I know enough to know there's two different TikToks. There's the Chinese one, and then there's the American one. And we get all the pornographic, time wasting, idiot stuff that makes you dumber as you watch it. And the Chinese, they're like little girls, uh, prodigies playing violins and solving Rubik's cubes two at a time. I'm like, yeah, we're gonna die immediately. <laughs> we're we're crashing and burning immediately. We're, we're human wastelands of stupidity. We need, to, we need to pull up on this plane right now. Beware social media. It is not your friend. Uh, I use social media. I'm actually here because somebody here found me on social media. So I'm using it and redeeming it for the good. But beware. Uh, there's even a documentary. What is it called? The Social Experiment? Am I doing that right? Y'all are real active listeners, so I turned over here because we're having a conversation over here. Here, a Air 5 up top, me and you. Bam, right there. So social experiment is talking about how even psychologically it's manipulating you and influencing you, changing your brain chemistry over time, right? Beware. Make sure you're using social media and social media isn't using you. All right, last one. Uh, I'm quoting Solzhenitsyn here, uh, and I want you to live not by lies, and I'm going to end on this one right here. Uh, in George Orwell's book, 1984, yeah, that's a popular book with this. Anyone not read 1984 in this room? It's like six of you. Hey, fix yourselves. What is wrong with you? <laughs> You sheepishly shot your own hand. There's, a, there's some liars in here, some other people. There you go. There's a late entry. Thank you. Your integrity is now intact. Way to go. The rest of you, read the book. It's a great book. But listen, culminating in the book of 1984 by George Orwell, uh, it's basically a dystopian future. The government has uh, basically overwhelmed the world. The globalists have everything kind of sequestered into these authoritarian regimes. Propaganda has run rampant, but there's this one guy who kind of wakes up, uh, and he's a dissenter, and he's recognized, this is not real, this is not true. But they find him, like cancel him, like uh, what you're seeing now, and they basically rewire him by force and through just flagrant manipulation. And so after they have broken his mind and made him toe in line with their political correct speech control, he is writing casually, this is the very end of the book, he writes two plus two equals five. Two plus two equals five, right? Now what that means is, is they had broke his mind enough 
that they were capable of convincing him of anything they wanted to. As soon as they can convince you that two plus two equals five, as soon as they can convince you that you shouldn't trust your own eyes or your own ears or your own mind, logic, and experience, as soon as they can twist the facts, they own you. You are a perfect psychological slave. You are easy to be manipulated. Now today, it's not two plus two equals five. It's different. It's men can have babies. That's our two plus two equals five. And minds are breaking, being highly manipulated. Our souls have been hijacked. Our brains have also been enslaved to a woke ideology that is having you deny your very senses and plain reason. Men can menstruate. Really? That's disgusting, by the way. <laughs> Immediately, my mind tries to work that out. I'm like, whoa, no, abort, abort. This is awful, <laughs> terrible. Men can't become women. You just can't. Men can't become women. Women can't become men. And the moment that you, in the name of being civil or polite, back off and say, oh, I don't want to upset anyone here, and we keep backing away from truth, we cede the battlefield to this insanity and it spreads like wildfire. There's only one way to live in a world of lies. There's only one way to defeat a world of lies and that's to boldly come forward and speak the truth and say, I will not live by lies. Yes. And if you choose to live by lies, just know you are not free. You are not free. That's all I got. Let's do some question stuff. All right, it's that time again. You can line up at the back of the room. If you'll come up and please state your name, where you go to school, and a brief question. Thank you so much for coming to speak today. My name is Lindsay Allen, and I go to Liberty University. Go Flames. Um, so we've been doing a Bible study this week throughout the conference, and we were studying in Romans about how Paul talks about, you know, submitting to governing authorities at a time when Christians were literally being burned alive in the streets of Rome. And so I'm just kind of conflicted when it comes to civil disobedience in regards to kind of tertiary issues like gun control laws and like wearing masks during COVID. Like, I don't agree with it, but I just feel like I'm just kind of conflicted when it comes to like what the Bible says on it. And then like, I just want to get your opinion. So there are some times in the way of civil disobedience where it is the obligation of the Christian believer to disobey the ruling authorities. One place is in Acts chapter four, uh, when ruling authorities said, hey, do not speak about this Jesus anymore. And they basically had to say, hey, you judge for yourselves whether it's right for us to obey God or man but we can't stop speaking about what we've said. I'm like, no, I'm gonna keep speaking about Jesus. I mean, you can imprison me, you can kill me, but I'm gonna talk to the jailers about it too. I'm not gonna shut up. I'm never gonna shut up, you can't stop me. And so no, that, that's a very Christian thing. We should pray for us often so that we might boldly declare the gospel, Ephesians 6, as we ought to. I'm like, no, it's, it, it's obviously the world hates you. Remember, they murdered Jesus because he would not be controlled by them. If he'd listened to the governments, he wouldn't have been murdered, you know? Uh, they, they couldn't shut him up. They couldn't shut up his disciples. And far be it from you that they shut you up too, uh, right? The idea, though, is there's a time to submit and there's a time not to. So make sure when you say, like, I don't feel like, I don't feel like going slow. I'm speeding, baby. You know, you're like 200 miles an hour on the interstate. It could be fun. It could be cathartic. You're probably going to die immediately. But you don't get to hold up scripture and be like, well, the Bible said I could speed. No. No, you're an idiot. I didn't say that at all. So you got to judge when it's okay uh, to submit, when you should submit, and when you shouldn't. You got to obey the laws of man. Now, when it comes to the Second Amendment, this is fantastic in that the highest law of the land, do y'all know what it is? It's the Constitution. Our whole government's built on the Constitution. That's what it means to be an American, right? Is we have the Constitution. Now, the Constitution says in our Second Amendment, our Bill of Rights, it says that uh, the government may make no law that infringes upon the right of the people to keep and bear arms. So if that's the highest law of the land when it comes to firearms, and then they make a smaller law under the Constitution that says you can't 
have guns or do something that infringes, it's contradicting the highest law of the land and you don't have to follow, it's an illegal law. It's an illegal law. Uh, so I would advise, because I want to be careful here, uh, that you go forward with wisdom, but on its face I can say uh, all infringements of the Second Amendment are illegal laws. My name is Alma. Um, you said the government shouldn't have a monopoly of force, but as it is now, if the military had to go against the people, they would probably win. So the drastic question is, should citizens be allowed to own things like tanks? Um, I would, great question, and I would adore a tank. How many of y'all would like me to have a tank? I'd be good. The yays have it. I do want a tank. That would be fantastic. Yeah, so... Now, our right to bear arms doesn't mean we would win, but it does mean we have a fighting chance. It does mean that it, if we had no guns, then oh, we'll just steamroll right over. You can't really do anything. But if we do have guns, we realize people have to risk their lives. Soldiers have to risk their lives coming after us. And realize also, uh, I, I was a former military guy. There's a lot. Yeah, all right, legal army indeed. So uh, there's a lot of dudes in those left uh, ranks, left to right, of like go, you know, against the populace. I'm like, well, that's my hometown, you know? And so a lot of those soldiers don't want to do that either. Uh, but um, anyway, it doesn't mean that we are going to absolutely win. You notice all the gun-free zone areas are where all the active killers flock. I think 95% of all ca active killer events happen in gun-free zones. Now... What if they weren't gun-free zones? Now the bad guy knows, well, there might be guns there. And even the idea that there might be resistance makes them not, not fight there. Similarly, the government treads uh, more cautiously when they realize there is recourse. If there's no recourse, yeah, it's a uh, game day, yeah. All right, thanks. Hello, my name is uh, Vincent Corey. I go to uh, St. Louis University, but I'm from Peoria, Illinois. And uh, while uh, Illinois is not perfect, I do intend on staying there, but that requires me to do a lot more to hold around from its property taxes and other things. So my question is, is how, do I, um, how do I apply homestead rules to those to a high level? That, made, that came out of my mouth wrong, but. Uh, yeah, great question. Of In my desire to be as free as possible, I recognize if I lived in a state that was not free, I would need to move. The best way you could become more free is move to a place where freedom exists. Because if it's bad now, it's probably going to continue to get bad by the way things are trending. I hope different, uh, but hope is not a course of action. Uh, so I, what I see is this massive exodus from blue states toward red of California, I just uh, put in a bid for a home down in Georgia. And as such, the properties were going like wildfire. They're just disappearing immediately. I'm like, well, I thought everyone was broke. I'm like, no, it's all money from out west. It's California and Washington. They're buying them sight unseen for over asking price. There's this massive wave of people fleeing these blue states that are failing. And so I think you should find a place that'll allow you to exercise the amount of freedom uh, that you would be satisfied with. Uh, now, if you, I don't know what Illinois' homesteading laws are. And if, I mean, imagine that, if like, you can't just own, own your own place and grow some stuff. I can't imagine, what, what is it? What is the laws there that are um, against you there homestead. for homesteading? Uh, just, there's just a lot of problems. I can't think of that on top of my head, unfortunately. I just thought some advice. But I will Got say it. this is maybe ways to save to preserve money would be a better way of... What's a way to preserve money? At a better way of form. Got it. So one is uh, there was a time where I was like, don't put money on your mattress. We have it in the banks. I'm like, well, I don't really trust the banks anymore. <laughs> so uh, I don't want all my money in banks, and I do want physical assets as well that don't lose all their value with uh, inflation. And so I'm buying inflation-proof assets. 
Cash is very risky when inflation is taking off to the tune of some 10% or something wild. It's hard to even know what the real number is because of inflation. Um, I, I don't know that uh, Illinois has any laws against homesteading on the books, but I would want you to be able to live the li build a life in an area where you can live as you would like to. If like, for, for instance, some states have really goofy laws on your ability to homeschool your kids. And that's a deal breaker for us. We're homeschool or bust. We're not giving them to the government to train. And so if you wanna build a life in a state that isn't friendly toward homeschooling, don't get too far down the road. Move and go someplace where you can be free, right? Mr. Lovell, thanks for coming. And uh, speaking of homeschooling, I'm, a, I'm an entrepreneur, a business owner. My, my mom homeschooled me. Awesome. Before it was cool. Um, I run in a lot of crowds with entrepreneurs, very successful people. They all homeschool their kids. I don't think that's necessarily always the option for everybody, but I am curious to hear what you do. Do you have a family? And, and if you do, what do you do for their education? So we are a homeschooling family. My oldest is 11. He just waved at me and he's awesome and I'm so proud. Uh, they've never seen the inside of a government school. They never will. Uh, while, yeah, they're um, under my authority. Uh, and we're having a blast. We wanted to study Egypt, so we went to Egypt. And now we're studying the nation's founding because we came here a couple days early. We'll stay here a few days and we're hitting all the museums and we're doing all the sites. We're learning American history. Uh, we were just at MLK Jr.'s monument yesterday and I was teaching them all about the civil rights movement and why MLK Jr. was so significant and how he was renamed after Martin Luther, the great reformer. From <laughs> oh, so funny. So last year I mentioned uh, Martin Luther and I got in so much trouble because there's so many Catholics here. And yeah. I, just, I just accidentally did it again. So I'm going to go ahead and cut it off right now. <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and cut it off. Catholics, don't come at me. I love you. Yay. Peace. Uh, peace. You guys are awesome. Be nice to me. But Martin Luther King Jr. And that was neat. We're, we're learning and going. And they're wild. I, I guarantee you that my nine-year-old son has re read more books than most college graduates have in the United States. I really do believe that. They homeschool. So, uh, and uh, are we out of time or one more? Uh, I haven't got the cutoff yet, so. Yeah. All right, send it. Good morning, Mr. Lovell. My name is Daniel Avey. Um, I graduated high school from my kitchen table. But I'm currently uh, at Embry-Riddle Aeronautical University, and I'm in Air Force ROTC. Awesome. And we, you talked a lot about freedom, and when you join the military, you lose a lot of that freedom. What's your opinion on joining the military in today's day and age? Uh, yeah, you're fighting for freedom, and to do that, you have to give up certain liberties to do. That's part of why I'm super grateful for your service. Let's give this guy a round of applause. <laughs> Yeah, it's kind of the nature of the sacrifice, too, of like, I'm going to follow the orders of my commanding officers now, and there's a chain of command, and there's a reason, an expediency, a practicality, and a necessity to do that. And so you're exchanging some personal freedom in order to serve a greater cause to protect everyone else's freedom. So that's kind of the gig. Uh, so I recognize that is a must do in the military. Now, there are also lines for me that I wouldn't cross. I'm like, I'm not gonna take an experimental vaccine because the commander told me to. I'm not gonna violate my conscience. I'm not going to denounce my faith. I'm not going to operate in a way that uh, would displease my heavenly father. I won't do it. Uh, and so they can tell me otherwise and I'll tell them to pound sand. Anything else, I'll follow the orders, but I won't violate scripture or conscience. And so that's how I roll on the military now. All right, so that will conclude our Q&A. Thank you, sir. Let's go in one more Thanks. round of applause. Thanks, guys. You guys are awesome. Oh, great.